Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our Bible study for noonday today, which is February 10th. Amen. This is a pre recorded message because of my eye surgery, which should have occurred on yesterday. And I uh, continue to ask your prayers for myself and for my family. Would you please bow your heads with us? Father in heaven, we thank you now for blessing us to come together for our Bible study time. We ask, Lord God, that you would bless each and every individual member and, fa and their family that is watching this video, that continues to participate in Bible study, that continues, Lord, taking the yoke upon themselves to learn of you. We praise you even now, Lord, for all that you shall say and do for us, to us, through us. Let your word be written in our hearts so that we might not sin against you. But help us, Lord God, to not only hear, but to remember that which we have heard and make it a part of our daily lives. We ask these blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll be beginning today at Isaiah chapter 35 and verse number 6. Isaiah chapter 35 verse number six. Now chapters 34 and 35 both went together. 34, he talks about his judgment against the Edomites. And even here in 35, I use that to help convey what God shall do in terms of his restoration of that land where he once destroyed. But 35 is also parallel to what he shall do to the church in the future. OK, so his great restoration of the church itself, uh, it ought to make us happy because of the simple fact that we see the state the church is in today. And that's why our theme for this year is about being reinvigorated and um, our scripture. If the trumpet make an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? Well, we know that there is a battle coming, but it's not going to be fought physically. It's going to be fought spiritually and it's going to have tremendous ramifications both in the physical world as well as in the spiritual world indeed we already see the spiritual battle being has begun and is being waged and right now it doesn't look good for us because we see the great falling away that jesus said would happen the bible says would happen happening right now as people turn away from church um with the plague that is going on right now, I see that as God's effort to get us to return to him. In light of our scripture that we always quote, if my people which are called by my name would humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, pray. These are the things that God is telling us to do. But you don't see America doing that. You see so many people turning to science, science. We're going to beat this with science. You don't really need science to beat it. As children of faith, faith will beat all of this. If we would return to God, we would see the hand of God moving. All God has to do is speak the word and you know, whatever he says, it shall be done. So COVID can be entirely eradicated by God simply speaking the word to eradicate it and it would be gone. Amen. So as children of faith, that is what we place our trust in is God's word. Amen. Amen. So here we uh, we're talking about his restoration and how things are going to be changing for the better. Remember last Sunday when we hit verse five, the eyes of the blind shall be open. And, and it's not just a literal sense, physically blind. Now they're physically able to see, but more so in the spiritual sense, there are a lot of a lot more people who are spiritually blind. They look at and can see the words of truth, but they do not understand the meaning of those words. Amen. So their eyes shall be open, but not only the eyes, because what's most important, more important than the eyes when it comes to faith is the ears. The ears of the deaf, verse five said, shall be unstopped. Now the ears are necessary because the ears themselves Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So that is why the ears are even more important than the eyes. Amen. Let's look at verse six. Then shall the lame man leap as an heart and the tongue of the dumb sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert. Wow. 
This is a beautiful verse of scripture also about the restoration. Then shall the lame man leap. The lame man would be one in this instance who is not able to leap, therefore not able to stand, not able to walk, not able to get up. Uh, what today we would look at it as someone who is crippled. Well, what the scripture is saying is that that shall be removed and that person shall leap. But what we fail to see sometimes because we focus so much on the physical is that there is also a spiritual lameness, okay? There are people who go to church and they want to shout, but they don't. Either out of fear or they find some excuse. The preacher didn't preach good enough for me to shout today. Uh, I was just too tired. We have whatever reasons we use to try to explain away the fact that we have a spiritual condition of lameness. The Bible says, let everything that hath breath Praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. That does not mean that every single time you go to church, you've got to stand up and shout and scream at the top of your lungs and praise the Lord. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is this. You cannot always go to church and never, ever, ever, ever want to say amen, feel like getting up and shouting, actually get up and shout sometimes. Let your soul rejoice in the Lord and the word of the Lord. Because if that never, ever, ever happens, how can the word, which is life and gives life, touch your soul and your soul not rejoice ever? You've got to rejoice at something. You've got to show some type of emotion, some type of reaction to the word of God. I'm not saying, you know, shouting is preferred over amens or amens are preferred over shouting or you got to say hallelujah. I'm not saying that you've got to do it this way because there's no real structure to that, but it is done in such a way that it will glorify God because our attention is never to draw attention to ourselves. So we say that, we say that our intention is never to draw attention to ourselves, I want to make it very clear, because we are not the one that people ought to focus on. Christ is the one we ought to focus on. And if I feel like shouting because my soul is so filled with joy and rejoicing at his word, it's okay for me to shout. It's okay. If I want to say amen to what the preacher's saying, that's fine. Even if my neighbor's like, oh, like they didn't like what was just said, but your spirit agrees with what was just said, it's okay for you to say amen. Don't keep silent for fear of what others might say to you. That's the wrong thing to do, especially in God's house, okay? So the lame shall leap as in heart, and the heart we know is like the gazelle, it's like the roe, it's like the hind, graceful animals that can run real fast but take huge and great leaps covering big distances and jumping very high into the air so the lame man shall leap as an heart meaning with that kind of bound and joy and expression he says and the tongue of the dumb sing now this is one that the dumb being dumb of speech if you remember my last sermon i kind of touched on that then that shall be loosed and the tongue shall not only speak, but they shall break out in song. Why? For in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert, in dry places, in places where there is typically no life or life is extremely harsh for anything to survive. What is most necessary in those dry places, it was going to break forth waters, streams, and streams in the desert. Notice in the desert, a dry place where you would say there is no water. Not only will they find water, it will be a stream of water in the desert. God restoring life to a place that was barren. Okay, let's look at verse number seven. And the parched ground shall become a pool and the thirsty land springs of water in the habitation of dragons where each lay shall be grass with reeds and rushes. God shall cause the land to be reborn like the new birth. Okay. 
For us, when we think of the new birth experience, a person that is lost in their sins, and suddenly they receive Christ as their Savior, they confess with their mouth the Lord Jesus, they believe in their heart that God is raised them from the dead, they are saved at that conversion point where there is the rebirth experience in, internal, in here, okay, the heart, then what this is relating to is just like that. He shall restore the land to her former glory. Remember, it was a desert. Now they got streams of water flowing through desert places. He's going to restore the land to her former glory. In our case, spiritual, he will restore the church, which had become dry because people were no longer attending. People were no longer desirous to hear the word of the Lord. It shall become a fertile place again, and people will flock to it. Why? If you're in a desert place, the one thing that you will want most of all is water. First and foremost, water. Second, you want food. But what did he say? In a desert place, streams. The stream will be the word of God coming into that desert place to revive his church. He's going to restore everything that is there. This says something to us about salvation also. We who were dead in our trespasses and sins can also be reborn to a newness of life. Remember the joy you had the day you understood and accepted Christ as your Savior. Now, I'm making a specific point here. Remember that day when you first understood and accepted Christ and your soul was saved because you felt the regeneration in your heart. You know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you had become born again that day. Remember the joy of that day, how you felt on the inside, how the relief of the burdens, the weight of sin being taken off of you, how joyous that day was. Here's the question. Where is that joy now? Before you say, it's still here, before you say that, judge yourselves that you be not judged. That's what the Bible tells us to do, right? It's not in, in just one specific thing. It's in all things. We need to judge ourselves so that we be not judged. And when we judge ourselves, we don't do it based on our own opinions and thoughts. We do it based upon that which is the plumb line for Christianity, Jesus Christ. Because his plumb line will reveal any and all sin that is within us. Okay? So, where is that joy now? And what that means is, when I go to church, do I still feel the same way as I did that day? If I say that, yes, I do, I still love the Lord. Okay, then, why doesn't the joy show on a Sunday in church? Why are there Sundays where, well, I don't feel like shouting a day or doing nothing. I'm just here. Y'all, I'm tired. I've had a rough week. You don't understand. No, the truth is the one that comes to church and with that kind of a mentality, mentality does not understand where they are. Because if we understood, God has brought us through another week. God has brought us through trials and tribulations. God has brought us through heartaches. God has brought us through um, so much in that week that to be there in the presence of him in his house one more time, we ought to have so much joy in us that when the choir sings, maybe I can't carry a tune in a bucket as one friend of mine likes to say, but I'll tell you this, get on up and sing with them anyway. You'll be amazed at what God will do for your soul when you join in to the worship. The choir gives leadership in singing, but the intent is that the congregation will join in with them, not sit back to be entertained because this is not entertainment. This is about where your soul will spend eternity. This is life giving to the believer. So we have to be serious and take it serious. That's why he says there in verse seven, in the habitation of dragons where 
each lay shall be grass with reeds and rushes. And now, again, don't be confused by that word dragons. Don't think of fire-breathing, flying dragons like we have in a mythological sense. Think of what that is translated. If you look at the NIV, that word for dragons is translated jackals. And we know what a jackal is, okay? So in the, the NIV puts it this way. In the haunts where jackals once lay, grass and reeds and papyrus will grow. God's going to cause the vegetation to come back and to increase, okay? Which is a good thing in a desert place, all right? Verse 8, and an highway shall be there, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those. The wayfaring men, though fools, shall not err therein. Okay? Now, let's look at this. Verse 8. Now, when it references a highway, he's talking about, for, for, for lack of better excuse, a causeway, okay? Um, it's like a causeway, but it's such a causeway that in the Hebrew root word, what that means, highway, the Hebrew root word means to cast up. So we talk about a stairway to heaven. We talk about a highway to heaven, you know, and we sing that song, it's a highway to heaven, none can go up there but the pure in heart. Okay. That is an expression that helps us to understand what he's actually talking about here in verse number eight. Now, that causeway concept was what was used to march armies on, wide paths where the army could fit on rather than a narrow path to transport troops someplace, okay? Now then, um, that highway that shall be there and a way on that highway, and it shall be called the way of holiness. Okay, so this is not your typical uh, uh, pathway here on earth. This is to cast up, and therefore we get that expression, a highway to heaven, okay? It is the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. Who are the unclean? The unsaved, the unrepentant, those whose sins still remain. But notice he says, it will be for those who walk in that way, or it shall be for those, the wayfaring men. Okay? Now, the NIV says, who walk in that way. He says, the NIV also says, so that you say, though fools shall not err therein. He says, wicked fools will not go about on it. It is not a pathway for the wicked. It is not a pathway that the wicked can stumble onto and go on up anyway. It is not a pathway wherein the unsaved will be able to traverse up because it's going to take us up towards being the highway of holiness to the kingdom of heaven, so to speak. We're using that imagery here. So we know, we know the Bible says the trumpet shall sound, the dead in Christ shall rise. We who are alive and remain will be caught up to meet him in the air. That is for the saved. For the unsaved, they will not be caught up to meet him in the end. They shall not all be changed. I wish I could show that video for you where uh, the preacher was preaching about Christ coming back and the need for us to repent of our sins and the need to be born again and the salvation afforded us through Jesus Christ. And he's preaching to a congregation that is just packed with people. All of a sudden, there's a flash of lightning, this really loud clap of thunder like when lightning strikes real close to your home you just see the bip bam and it kind of rattles stuff it was like that and in that flash the preacher and a lot of people in the church were gone but not everybody there were still people left behind in the church who began to cry they understood what had happened they understood the truth of scripture. We shall all be changed in a flash, in a twinkle of an eye. They went the flash, boom, we were gone, but they were left behind. They were not gone. Why? Because they were not saved. They did not know him. And they began to try to repent then and there, but it's already too late. Okay? So this way will be there. There will be a way for people to get saved. 
but only the saved shall traverse it. The unrepentant, the unsaved, those who play church, those who put on a pretense and uh, show that I am saved, but inwardly in their heart, they have never been regenerate. They've never been born again. They shall not be able to traverse up that highway. Okay. Verse nine, no lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go up thereon. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. Okay. So in verse nine, no, nothing that will cause one to fear, nothing that could harm you shall be on that pathway. Understand that. Only the redeemed of the Lord shall walk there. You will not be going up the pathway looking at somebody saying, how did you get here? They might be looking at you saying the same thing. You have. Well, how did you get here? We won't even be concerned with who's, who's going up the pathway and who's not. We're going to be looking with our eyes straight forward, wanting, desiring to see the Son, our Savior. And we will be able to see him. But only those who are born again, who are saved, whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life, will be able to traverse this path. Look at verse 10. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Wow. Who are the ransomed of the Lord? Everyone who confesses with their mouth the Lord Jesus and believes in their heart that God has raised him from the dead, they are the ransomed of the Lord. Now, we know what ransom means when someone is being held captive and they demand a, rams, a, rams, ugh, a ransom to set them free. Then the ransom is paid and they're set free. That exact scenario helps us to understand we were the ones held captive by sin. Jesus paid it all. He paid the ransom for us. His life he gave at Calvary. Now, because the ransom is paid, we have been set free, those who believe, excuse me, those who believe, and we are now the ransomed, okay, and, and of verse 10, and the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion and look at how we will enter in with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness. And look at this. Sorrow and sighing shall flee away. No more sorrow. No more suffering. No more pain. Hallelujah. But I pray for that day. So it is a good thing here that we see happening in this particular chapter, chapter 35. Now, let's press on to chapter 36. Now, beginning in chapter 36, I want you to note this because chapter 36 kind of plays back over a lot of the prophecies that we've already heard because chapters 36, 37, 38, 39, these chapters will close out the first division of Isaiah's prophecies because Isaiah's prophecies are broken into division. This will close out the first division. It's a large division, the first one. So uh, we'll see a lot of this. Now, beginning at verse number one. Now, it came to pass in the 14th year of King Hezekiah. And uh, don't, don't get mi mixed up by this. Remember, I told you, do not think that because the Bibles in the book are in this particular order, that the events of the Bible happen in that exact same order chronologically. There is... As I showed you before on a map, how the books overlap and where books were written and things like that, Isaiah prophesied back during Hezekiah's time, okay? So we see that here. Now, it came to pass in the 14th year of King Hezekiah that Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the defense cities of Judah and took them. Now, I want you to catch what this verse says, okay? So... It is King Hezekiah's 14th year, 14th year, okay, catch that, as king, that Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against the defensed cities of Judah. Had to get some water, y'all, sorry. Throat's dry due to medications, all right? 
Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against the defense cities of Judah and took every single one. Now, what does he mean when he says defense cities of Judah? Every place that offered a man-made refuge in Judah was overthrown by the Assyrian armies. Okay, so what that means is the cities that had a wall built around them for defense. Those are the ones that were attacked and the Assyrians were defeating and overcoming every city in Judah that they were attacking. Okay, so this threat has arrived. Verse two, and the king of Assyria sent, and now just so you know, I'm gonna turn my speaker up here. Hopefully you can hear this, the pronunciation of this name. Rob Shaki. Rabshake, okay? Rabshake. And there's a meaning to that name, which I'll reveal in just a moment. And the king of Syria sent Rabshake from Lachish to Jerusalem unto King Hezekiah with a great army. And he stood by the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the Fuller's Field, okay? So, Sennacherib sent Rabshakeh, Rabshakeh. Now, Rabshakeh is not the full name of his, uh, or his full first name, because the Rab before his name, that is a part of his name, is actually the, his title attached to his name. It's kind of like uh, when people address me, if you remember when I first came to Morningstar, I said, please address me as Pastor Henderson. Pastor's not my first name. It's a title. And then my name, Rab Shake. The word Rab is a title of authority, which means chief cup bearer. And we know that is a position in reference to the king because kings... If somebody didn't like them, they could, someone could try to poison them. So the king had a cupbearer, a chief cupbearer, whose job it was to taste everything. He put his life on the line for the king. Well, the king chose his chief cupbearer, Rabshakeh, to send him as the ambassador to Jerusalem. Okay? We're going to see all of this as this unfolds. Now, he sent him to King Hezekiah, and he sent him with a great army. Now, he went and stood by the conduit, okay? Now, Lachish is a town southwest of Jerusalem, and it's in the land of Judah. And it was also known to be a greatly fortified city. So now they had conquered all of these other cities, but this one was a greatly fortified city, okay? Lachish was. So they had come from the quiche to Jerusalem, meaning what? They had defeated this greatly fortified city. I'm painting the picture for you here. You'll, you'll see the whole picture in a moment. Verse three, then came forth unto him Eliakim, Eliakim, Hakiah's son, which was over the house, and Shep, oh boy, these names, I tell you, What's beautiful though, y'all, and what we would say is Shebna is that Shebna is actually Shebna, the scribe. And then you have what looks like we would say Joah, but you don't you may not know there is no J sound in the Hebrew language. There's no J sound. Like we would say when we see the word J on the word job, we would say job. There's no J sound. It's really more like a Y sound, okay? So this J-O-A-H, listen to its pronunciation. Uh, turn my speaker down. Let me do that again. Yo-ah. Yo-ah is how it's actually pronounced. And the A-H has the uh, ah, that ah on the end of it. I'm just helping you to understand a little bit about Hebrew language, okay? So if you want to say Joa, you say Joa, but the pronunciation is Yo-ah. And he's Asaph's son, and he is a recorder. So I want you to look. We have Eliakim. He's over the house of Hezekiah, King Hezekiah. So he's a man of great importance and a leader. But he uh, he's all, 
Hezekiah also sent a scribe and a recorder to meet this ambassador. So you get this picture here. Verse 4. And Rab Shake said unto them, See ye now to Hezekiah, say ye now to Hezekiah, thus saith the great king, the king of Assyria, what confidence is there wherein thou trustest? Now what's happening here? These small group, the men, meet the army behind Rabshake, and you got the fortified city of Jerusalem, and outside the walls have come whom King Hezekiah sent to meet this approaching army. The intent of this is that they would talk in hopes of there not even being a battle. They would resolve whatever differences that they are, okay? So Hezekiah, being smart, sent a scribe and a recorder also to record the words of everything that was going to be said, okay? So notice how Rab Shakeh says, speaks. He says, say now to Hezekiah, he wants them to take this message back to their king, thus saith not the king, but the great king, okay? the great king, the king of Assyria. So he's being very specific. So I want you to, to see this. Rabshakeh is mocking King Hezekiah. He calls him by his name, but without his title. Say ye now to Hezekiah. They say, say to King Hezekiah. So he's mocking him as if to say he is no king. So you see the start in of what is happening by the enemy who is representing the king of Assyria, Sennacherib, okay? So say to him, thus saith the great king, meaning Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, Sennacherib, what confidence is this wherein thou trusted? The Assyrians figure this, that since they have conquered so much that the armies that they've not yet encountered should tremble in fear before them, but instead they encounter an army ready to fight them. So they want to know what is the reason for their confidence. Why, it's like saying, why aren't you trembling in fear? Don't you see what I just did to all these other cities, these other places, and how they have not been able to withstand us? Why do you stand as if you will succeed against us? Okay? It's fear trying to confront faith. All right? So they want to know what is the reason for their confidence. Now I have a question. Why do you think they could win when all others that have faced this Assyrian army have failed? Well, this is Jerusalem. This is the holy city. This is God's people. So were everyone within the land of Judah, the tribe of Judah. Why didn't God defend all of those places? Because he has a will and he has a plan. Okay? We can't tell God how to do what God does. He's God. He does what he wants, when he wants, how he wants, where he wants. He's God. He can do it. But something specific is being done here. Okay, and we're going to reveal that. We get the chance to this today. We'll reveal it if not next time. Verse 5. He says, I say, sayest thou, this is still Rabshakeh speaking, but they are but vain words. I have counsel and strength for war. Now on whom dost thou trust that thou rebellest against me? Okay, so Rabshakeh continues his mocking of the lead of the armies of Israel, Eliakim even, because he's out there representing them, mocking their military strength and the very fact that they even have a strategy, if, one, if, if one, at least one, against the Assyrian army. He mocks them by asking upon whom they are depending. Now on whom dost thou trust? Who do you depend upon that you would rebel against me? He's not done yet. Look at verse 6. Lo, thou trusteth in the staff of this broken reed on Egypt, whereon if a man lean, it will go into his hand and pierce it. 
So is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all that trust in him. This is it's a beautiful picture that's being painted. I'm going to take verse 7 with verse 6. But if thou say to me, we trust in the Lord our God, is it not he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah hath taken away and said to Judah and to Jerusalem, ye shall worship before this altar? Whoa. Let's look at 6 and 7, okay? Beginning with verse 6. Now, Rav says that if they trust in the armies of Egypt, they'll fail. Why? Because the armies of Egypt were known for not being faithful. They were known for not being faithful. Remember, Israel tried to trust in when they sent the noblemen who went to try to hire the armies of Egypt when the Assyrians came. Where were the armies of Egypt? They didn't show up. And the Syrians tore through them and plundered, right? Well, here we see that coming back into play, okay? So with six, you can't trust in Egypt because they will fail you. But look at verse seven, because here he says, oh, and by the way, if you trust in the Lord, but he did not say your God, he said our God. We trust in the Lord, our God. And he's mocking them because he's putting this word there. If thou say to me, we trust in the Lord, our God. So in this sense, he's not saying that their God is the God of the Assyrians. Remember that. Is it not he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah hath taken away and said to Judah and to Jerusalem, you shall worship before this altar? Now, he undoubtedly knows some of the history of Hezekiah and what Hezekiah had done. Did Hezekiah actually destroy places of worship where the people could go and worship God? Yes, he did. But Rob, Rab, uh, that name still sometimes it trips me up. Rab Shake, Rab Shake is not telling you the whole truth. He's only telling you a piece of it to lead you to believe a certain thing. Why would Hezekiah tear down places of worship where people would go to worship the God of Israel? There's a reason why, okay? Let's see. Now, uh, these are my notes I made when I was studying all this. But then Rabshake goes even further, mocking the very God of Israel, because as he believes, King Hezekiah took away the places of worship dedicated for the people to worship him. But that is not entirely true. Now, here's why. King Hezekiah tore down the altars that were dedicated to, to Jehovah, to God. But in these places that he tore down, people worshipped under an image in violation of the second commandment. What second commandment? I'm talking about the second of the Ten Commandments. No graven image. Neither of things on earth, nor of things in heaven, nor things under the earth, nor things in the sea. No graven image. We cannot liken God to any kind of graven images. And in, the, and in these places that Hezekiah tore down, they had put up images that made people believe this is what God looks like. This is who God is. Why is God so zealous? I didn't say jealous. Zealous that there not be an image. Because no one has ever seen him and therefore you cannot liken him unto anything else. Never forget what God said back all the way in Genesis. Let us make man in our image. So if they had in one of these temples an image of a stone, a statue, or something that man had carved or made, Hezekiah didn't just destroy the image, he destroyed the whole temple there. Okay? So that's why 
Rabshakeh does not tell them the whole truth. He doesn't want them to understand why Hezekiah tore down. He just wants them to know you're a king even tore down places of, of worship where you used to go and worship your God. Trying to make Hezekiah look bad. Half truths can sometimes make folk look bad. Okay? We have to be very careful of that, y'all. I know because I've had it happen to me before. Verse number eight. Now, therefore, give pledges, I pray thee. This is still Rabshakeh talking. To my master, the king of Assyria, and I will give thee 2,000 horses if thou be able on thy part to set riders upon them. Oh, boy. All right. He is continuing to mock the king Hezekiah, and the armies of Israel. He's trying now to bribe Eliakim with 2,000 horses if he will give his pledge, and therefore pledge even of the armies, to Sennacherib. That's what he's asking here. And then at the tail end of that, he mocks them because, remember he said, I will give thee 2,000 horses? And he said, you, you don't even have 2,000 men to put on the horses. That's why he says, if thou be able on thy part to set riders upon them. He's mocking them and saying, look, my army is vastly greater than yours. Why not take what I am offering you? But he's not done yet. Go to verse number nine. How then wilt thou turn away the face of one captain of the least of my master's servants and put thy trust on Egypt for chariots and for horsemen? Rabshakeh, still mocking, tries to intimidate Eliakim by saying his forces couldn't even repel a small regiment of Sennacherib's forces. He is literally putting them down. It's like saying, I'm an elephant and you're an ant. How in the world will you prevail over against me? I will take my foot and just squash you. But let's avoid bloodshed here if you will just pledge your allegiance to my king, submit to his rule over you. Okay? That's really what he's trying to do. Um, it would be good probably at this point to introduce another thought as well. Is, does, isn't this the same tactic that Satan uses on us? Does not Satan say to us, I will give you this and this and this and this, if you will bow down and worship me, if you will honor me, if you will do what I said, you will be my servant. All this I'll give to you. Remember Jesus in the temptation in the wilderness, up on a high pinnacle, looking out over the kingdoms of the earth and said, I will give you all this if you will but bow down and worship me. What does Satan do? Listen, I will give you all these things that your flesh craves. Money, power, wealth, companionship, whatever it is your heart desires, I will give you that if you will but bow down and worship me. That's the same thing that is being portrayed here when we look at this story here in the Bible. So, verse 10, am I now come up without the Lord against this land to destroy it? The Lord said unto me, go up against this land and destroy it. This is still Rabshakeh speaking, y'all. Do you not catch what he's saying here in verse number 10? He's, his boasting has led him to tell a lie upon the God of Israel. What lie is he telling? I hope you caught it. In his attempts to dissuade Eliakim from battling, he invokes the name of the Lord, saying, the Lord, he's talking about their God, himself told me to march against this country and destroy it. God did not tell him that, even though God used them to bring about his will, God did not tell them, go and march upon this land and destroy it. He's saying God told him to. Their God told him to. He is trying to destroy their hope, their belief, their faith, everything in their God. That's what he's trying to do. 
Now, listen to this, because we're going to go back and pick up a verse of scripture from Isaiah chapter 10, verses 5 and 6. O Assyrian, the rod of mine anger and the staff in their hand is mine indignation. I will send him against the hypocritical nation and against the people of my wrath will I give him a charge to take the spoil and to take the prey and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. This was Isaiah's prophecy for what God was going to do to his people because they had turned their backs on him. He was going to use the Assyrian. But look at what, again, at what Rabshakeh says. He says, the Lord, your God, said unto me, go up against this land and destroy it. God put it in their hearts to move. He's saying, God told me to come and do this to you. God used them to come and do this. But to say God specifically spoke to him and told him, that's a dangerous statement for him to be making out. We should never, and we, and we talked about this in Sunday, this past Sunday school lesson because it came up. Those who come up and say, well, God told me to tell you. If you are saved and you have a relationship with the Lord, God can tell you for himself. Unless you know that you have wandered off from him and you are out in a place where you should not be. And then God sends a messenger out to tell you, you'll know if the word is from the Lord or not, because your spirit will react to that word. But you got to be careful. Don't just, you know, I want this to happen. And I've seen this happen, y'all. I've seen it happen in church conferences where the people wanted something that God had not said. And so they stand up and they want to say, well, God told me. Now, you better be very careful what you say after that, because if God did not tell you, God's going to get you. And you don't want God to come after you. He never fails. He never misses. His target is always on point. OK, so don't play with this. Don't take this lightly either. Verse 11, then said Eliakim and Shebna and Yoach unto Rabshakeh. Rab Speak, I pray thee, unto thy servants in the Syrian language, for we understand it, and speak not to us in the Jews' language, in the ears of the people that are on the wall. Wow. This is getting fixing it really good, y'all. So Eliakim, Shebna, and Yoach all respond together, telling Rab Shakeh to speak to his own servants in the Syrian language, which was Aramean. Why would they make such a request? The clue for us is the people that are on the wall behind them, listening to what is going on, that are within distance to hear what is being said. Well, they don't want them to hear the threats. We'll come back to that. Why would they make such a request? Because the Aramean language is understood by the Assyrians as belonging to the same family of languages as their own. Wait a minute. The more common language spoke was not the same Armenian language, but it was a language that they understood and not all the Jews would understand. Therefore, some people who were listening would not be able to understand what they were saying. What Rab Shakeh is trying to do is instill fear in the hearts of the Jewish people so that their hearts will melt and they will offer no resistance. As a matter of fact, they will join him and say, hey, 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 we don't want to die. You know what? Let's give in to them. Let's give in. Don't fight them. Don't fight them. Don't fight them. You know, that kind of fear in them. That kind of fear, my brothers and sisters, can be a very dangerous force. Let me give you a good example. Right now, if we had the money, if Born and Star Missionary Baptist Church had the money, right now, I would be encouraging us to start to build. Right now. Because the economy is down. This is the time to make contracts, get low interest rates, negotiate a lower price on what it is we, we need built, and have 
additions made to the church. Right now is that kind of time because you could really, 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 it's just a smart thing to do in this period of time that we're in right now before there is a rebound of the economy and prices go up and interest rates go up and people are no longer willing to negotiate down. You have to now try to fight against them giving the lowest bid that they could possibly give. Whereas before, they're trying to make their company survive right now so they would be willing to take on a lower bid if it meant the survival of their company. You catch my point? So right now would be a good time for us to build. But if that is what I was to propose right now, undoubtedly, Satan would have someone who would say, out of fear. Now ain't the time for us to be building. We need to conserve what we've got. We need to wait, y'all. Don't do it. They're trying to instill fear in people against doing. If God is saying build, premise, if God is saying build, then to go behind and say don't do it, is that a Christian speaking or is that the devil speaking through one of his own? It could be a fearful believer whose faith is weak. It could also be a servant of the devil who's trying to keep the blessings of God from being realized. I mean, there's a number of scenarios we could spell out here. We just have to be careful, y'all, very careful. What advantage could this possibly have if Rab Shakeh stop speaking in the Jewish language? The answer lies in the ending of this verse, which, you know, this is what I want to get to, in the ears of the people that are on the wall. The Jewish leaders fear that the people who were watching from the wall of the city, who were within hearing distance of the conversation, might become afraid. That fear might get instilled in their hearts. And then they turn and they spread that fear to other hearts and it spread throughout the city. And before you know it, even the armies don't want to fight. Everybody's afraid and, and, and without throwing a single blow, without lobbing a single arrow, they're able to subdue Jerusalem. That is not what they want to have happen. Okay. Let's see if we can get one more verse in verse 12. But Rab Shakeh said, Hath my master sent me to thy master and to thee to speak these words? Hath he not sent me to the men that sit upon the wall, that they may eat their own dung and drink their own piss with you? Now, I know that sounds a little vulgar, y'all, but that is exactly what the scripture says. From the NIV, it says, But the commander replied, Was it only to your master and you that my master sent me to say these things and not to the men sitting on the wall? who, like you, will have to eat their own filth and drink their own urine. So what is he saying? Rab Shakeh is able to sense what is going on and now desires to speak directly to the Jews who are watching from the wall in hopes of instilling fear in them. What effect does fear have on people? That's a Good question, even though we've started to answer that. What effect does fear have on people? Think about what fear does to you. It will cause them to act irrationally. It will paralyze them into inactivity. It will cause them to flee away. It will turn their hearts backward so that instead of going forward in faith, they now decide to retreat in fear. We could go on listing all the things that fear can cause ha to happen to us. We have got to be very careful, amen? My time is up. We're going to stop at verse number 12. We'll pick up at verse 13 on next time. And um, hopefully, God willing, everything will go really, really well. Amen. Now then, as always, please continue to pray for all those who are whose names are on our prayer list. Please remember me in your prayers as well. Pray for my wife as well and my entire family, I ask. I also want to uh, let you know that an email should have went out to everyone about the uh, conference, the, the call meeting we're going to have on Friday, February 12th. Um, I had said we would use the Morningstar Sunday School login and everything. 
and I got a call afterwards and they were saying, well, we have another one actually set up for doing the meetings and stuff like that. And I did not know I flipped my mind. So we're going to use that. So you should get an email from Sister Pratt saying this is the uh, the uh, access code and the password for the call meeting. If you did not get that, please email Sister Pratt so that she can get that to you. OK. Um, I think that's all that I wanted to really say at this particular point in time. Uh, continue to pray because your pastor is working on something for the church that uh, if we're able to implement, will come back and be a blessing for Morningstar, especially during this time and will help us as we uh, look forward to hopefully being uh, blessed by God to reopen our church. Amen. Let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you now for blessing us this day, Lord. We thank you, God, for all the blessings that you have sent our way. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We pray for those who are on our prayer list, each and every single name, Lord. We ask that you would bless in a special way. Remember Deaconess Chavis. Remember Deaconess Baker, Lord. Go by, visit, touch them with your hand and give them strength. Bless their days to roll on with ease. Bless their days, Lord God, to be filled with joy and family. Lord, we pray that you will continue to hold us and keep us as only you can do. Bless the Morning Star Missionary Baptist Church. We hope and pray, Lord, that there will be a day. We don't know when yet, but we know it will come. Just as surely as the scriptures have said, you would restore a day when that church will be able to be reopened. Bless us to come in and not be as we were before, but to be more appreciative of the opportunities afforded us to come into the house of the Lord and worship. Let us give more truth to the scripture, which says, I was glad when they said unto me, come, let us go into the house of the Lord. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. God bless your hearts, everyone.